The first time I met Kobe Bryant, he changed my life forever. I had the great fortune of, of starting to work with and meet Kevin Durant when he was 15 years old. And I watched Kevin play basketball as a sophomore for about five minutes. And I came to the following conclusion. Number one, this kid loves to play basketball. It was a hot summer day and he was playing his tail off, but he had a smile from ear to ear. Number two, this kid is fundamentally sound. He had pristine footwork and shooting mechanics, especially for someone his age. Number three, Kevin had a very high basketball IQ. He understood the game on a cerebral level that would rival most coaches. And number four, Kevin was a little bit slight of frame back then. He used to get really irritated with me when I would call him skinny, but Kevin was slight of frame. And it was obvious to me that the only thing that could prevent this young man from playing the game at a very high level would be lack of strength and power. Well, that was music to my ears because that's exactly what I did. I was a basketball strength and conditioning coach. So the thought that I may have something that this young man needed to get to the next level really excited me. But I got a little bit too amped up because within about 20 minutes of that workout, I hammered him. Within 20 minutes, Kevin was laying in a pile on the gym floor. And he was shaking, and he was sweating profusely. And Kevin was a very shy young man back then. He didn't say two words the entire workout. So I wanted to get some feedback. So I looked down at him and asked if he liked the workout. And he looked up, and as serious as can be, said, no, I didn't. But I know this is what I need to do if I want to make it to the NBA. So when can I see you again, coach? And I remember being blown away the maturity of this young man, that he was willing to lean into discomfort, he was willing to lean into sacrifice, but most importantly, he was willing to make a change. He was willing to change and make a sacrifice from what he wanted in that moment to what he wanted most of all. The first time I met Kobe Bryant, he changed my life forever. See, back in 2007, Nike flew me out to Los Angeles to work the first ever Kobe Bryant Skills Academy. Nike brought in the top high school and college players from around the country for an intense three-day mini camp with the best player in the world. And having grown up so closely around the game, I'd always heard this urban legend of how insanely intense Kobe's individual workouts were. Well, when I found myself on his camp staff, I figured, this is my chance. This is my shot. So at my earliest opportunity, I walked up to Kobe and asked if I could watch one of his private workouts. He was incredibly gracious and he smiled and he said, sure man, no problem, I'm going tomorrow at four. Well, I got a little bit confused because I had just got done looking through the camp schedule and the camp schedule clearly said that the first workout with the players was the following day at 3.30. Well, Kobe recognized that confused look on my face and clarified that with, yeah, that's 4 a.m. I walk in the side door of the gym, Kobe's already in a full sweat. See, he was going through an intense warm up before his formal workout with his trainer started at four. Well, out of professional courtesy, I didn't say anything to Kobe. I didn't say anything to his trainer. I just sat down to watch. And for the first 45 minutes, I was shocked. Kobe was doing stuff that I had routinely taught to middle school age players. Now don't get it twisted. This was Kobe Bryant. So he was doing everything with an unparalleled level of intensity. So later that day at camp, I went up to him again and said, Kobe, I don't understand. You're the best player in the world. Why were you doing such basic drills? And he flashed that million dollar smile. He gave me a very friendly wink, but he said in a very serious tone, why do you think I'm the best player in the world? Because I never get bored with the basics. And that's because the basics work. They always have and they always will. And the very first step to you improving performance in any area of your life, it doesn't matter if it's personal or professional, it doesn't matter if it's individual or organizational, but the very first step is to admit that the basics work. See, it is fantastic to have goals. It is fantastic to have a North Star. They provide clarity and they provide direction. But once you have the North Star crystallized, you can take your eyes off of it and you need to put it on what's right in front of you the daily behaviors, the action steps, 
execution of the playbook. Now, the best group that I've ever seen execute this is the men's basketball program at Queens University in Charlotte, North Carolina. Several years ago, I had an opportunity to work with their team and their coach, a gentleman named Bart Lundy. And at the time, they were one of the top Division II men's basketball programs in the United States, regularly making the Final Four and the Elite Eight and churning out professional players at the Division II level. And Coach Lundy and his staff did a remarkable job. And after watching a decade's worth of game film, they figured out that there were four key statistics that heavily dictated whether Queens would win the game. Number one, turnover differential. If we have more possessions than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. Number two, offensive rebound differential. If we take more shots than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. Number three, free throws attempted. The free throw in college basketball is the highest percentage shot based on each possession. If we can take more of those than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. And four, three-pointers attempted. The three-pointer in the college game is a massive weapon, and if we can take more clean looks from three than our opponent, it gives us a better chance to win. When Queens University comes out on top in those four statistical categories, they won 97% of their games. I'm gonna say that again, because I don't think y'all think that's as cool as I do. When they came out on top in those four statistical categories, they won 97% of their games. Now, I'm not a math major or a statistic major, but 97% means they were almost unbeatable when they did those four things, when they executed those four things. So now I'm gonna ask you lovely high performers for a, ser a series of rhetorical questions. What do you think Coach Lundy and his staff talked about, reinforced, and emphasized before every workout, every practice, every film breakdown, in every game? Those four things. What do you think Coach Lundy and his staff used to design every workout plan, every practice plan, every film breakdown, and every game plan? Those four things. Coach Lundy and his staff never talked about winning, never talked about championships, never talked about banners, and never talked about trophies. All they talked about were those four things. Because if they could execute those four things at a high level, the winning, the championships, the trophies, and the banners would all take care of themselves. When you focus on the process, the scoreboard takes care of itself. As a teenager, Steph Curry had always been a good shooter. But his father, NBA player Del Curry, knew that as his son got older, his unorthodox form would be a problem. Steph shot from a very low release point, and his father knew it'd be too easy for a better or taller player to block his shot. So Steph spent the whole summer before his junior year in high school reteaching himself how to shoot and changing his release point. It was a process that required him to fail over and over again at the one thing he'd been phenomenal at. Picture it, after years of being the best at something, a 15-year-old Steph Curry willingly changed how he did it because his future ceiling demanded it. This is one of the greatest leaving your comfort zone examples I can think of. Steph would not be who he is had he not done this difficult and emotionally painful thing. He could have stayed with his low release point, which had been working so far and still been the best shooter in his school. But he saw a bigger world and did the work in order to one day succeed there. 